Hello, welcome to our Lyman Book Club. I'm Laura. I'm Deanne. And I'm Philippe. Uh, we're here um, reading uh, part one, uh, chapters four and five of The Game of Kings by Dorothy Dunnett. Um, and so I will give a quick recap and then we will discuss. Um, so uh, where we start out is um, chapter four with Richard. Um, who is on his way home from harrying uh, after the retreating English troops uh, and helping to convince Scottish border families not to help the English. Um, and he stops and picks up Agnes Harry's to escort her to Sterling. Um, I have some thoughts about Agnes, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I love Agnes. So yes, let, it, let us talk about Agnes later. Agnes is a 13 year old, super rich heiress, um, not very pretty, has terrible manners and lives in a world of romantic fantasy. Um, with regrettable taste. Um, and importantly for the story, she's the fiance of the son of the governor of Scotland, Aaron. Um, so they run into Dandy Hunter, who invites them to his home of Balagan. Uh, but when crossing the river, uh, Richard and Agnes nearly drown. To recover, they go to the Douglas family castle, Drumlanrig, um, which I can show on the screen here. Um, here is can you see it? Very nice. Jump in there. Um, and we meet the Douglases, um, and the uh, the guy who is, I guess, the uh, head of Drum Lanrig is uh, married into the family, the brother-in-law, Sir James, but the big guy is Archibald Douglas, the sixth Earl of Angus, um, which is this guy. Um, and I love the way she describes him, lissom royal lover of 30 years ago, lost in alcoholic fat and sparse beard. Um, and by uh, royal lover, it's because he'd been married to Henry VIII's sister, Margaret Tudor, um, who had been married to the King of Scotland um, and, there, and was the mother of the two-year-old um, King, James V. So um, their child, uh, Margaret Douglas, um, has a strong claim on both the Scottish and English thrones. And um, am I also correct, is Margaret Douglas the wife of Lennox? Yes, exactly. Yes, that's what I thought. Exactly. Um, and then we also meet his brother, Sir George, uh, sly and splendid as a half-tamed leopard. Um, so they're super nice in a, kind of a fake way to Richard and Agnes and, uh, and Dandy Hunter. Um, well, George is the one who has Crouch, right? And George is the one who has Crouch. So then Richard kind of pretends to be asleep and listens in as Hunter convinces George Douglas to sell him Crouch um, affordably so that Hunter can exchange him for a favorite cousin of his mother's. Uh, or a favorite cousin, cousin of his who's a favorite of his mother's. Are we supposed to assume that Hunter is in league with Lyman somehow? Or no? Uh, tell me why you think that. Well, just because he's interested in Crouch. I'm just suspicious. There's definitely an interesting, why is he interested in Crouch? Okay. Um, so yes, perhaps he is. I, I thought he was either in league with Lyman or anti-Lyman in some way, <laughs> like because of the Crouch thing. Or Lyman in disguise, because that happens quite often. Yeah, but with his brother. I know, it's, it's not him this time, but I have the thought. Um, so basically, um, when- uh, Yeah, but I don't think he's that much <laughs> No, um, and, and uh, so then at that point, Richard, Ag Agnes, and Dandy leave, um, and we stay with the Douglases, who are um, kind of nasty people, um, and they're basically walking a tightrope, playing both sides with English and, English and Scottish, um, and kind of angling to get at the throne for themselves. Um, and, and like really nasty, the, the Earl Archibald says, pity the river wasn't a lot higher, and then George says, I wish that damn fellow Lyman would get on with it. Um, Interestingly, George is envious of uh, Lyman's intelligence system. Can I ask really quickly, when he made that comment about the river, was he implying that he wanted Richard dead or he wanted Agnes dead or both? Uh, well, we don't know for sure, but I think it was Richard because he was upset that um, Richard was convincing the border families to be uh, unhelpful to the English. Um, and then George asks an important question for our narrative, what went on between Lyman and Lennox anyway? If Margaret was involved, you'd do well to hush it up. Uh, we don't quite know what happened yet, but here's another clue that something important happened. 
Um, and we also learned why the English retreated in the previous chapter. We were wondering, like, they were about to win. Why did they leave? Uh, it's because they, did, they only had a month of food and they didn't get the support they expected from the border families, including the Douglases. Um, and then they also discuss in prep for the next chapter uh, that Lord Bray of Wilton, who's one of the English commanders, is recovering from a wound from swallowing a billhook and has a speech impediment as a result. Um, and this is actually a real historical uh, thing. He, uh, Lord Grey was injured in the Battle of Pinky and had this thing called Bill Hook like go into his mouth. So I don't know if there is a historical evidence that he had a lisp, but it's not a stretch to think he might have had a speech impediment as a result of the injury. Um, so on we go to the next chapter. Um, so we start out with our darling uh, Marigold, Will Scott, who I found some cute fan art of that I will share with you. Sweet, innocent Will. Um, and we basically learned that he spent the past month with Lyman and his merry men, um, and that he has developed an ambition to cast a shadow bigger, grander, and more devastating than Lyman's. Um, we also learned that, on a, surprisingly for a band of outlaws, they move around a lot, and they're currently at Appeal Tower, which is a little fortified tower um, along the English and Scottish border. So here's some pictures of Appeal Towers. Um, so we kind of learn more about how Lyman uh, runs this band of merry men. Um, he has, Lyman had genius choosing and shaping 60 men, um, fashioning them into a shining and precise instrument for advanced theft, blackmail, and espionage, and faults in the instrument were dealt with instantly and with a hard inventiveness. Um, and he, Lyman sounds quite nasty here, like bringing his men into, on their knees in tears just, just from his terrible things that he would say to them. Uh, we also hear that he isn't always sober, and uh, Will can recognize this by his slurred walk and gentle dishevelment. Uh, so Will and Turkey Matt chat about how Turkey can stand him, and it's basically because Lyman is the golden goose, his plans uh, are successful and bring them money, and Turkey's going to retire someday with the money he makes. Um, so then Lyman returns, he talks about what he's been up to. He was at the Ostrich, which is a whorehouse on the English side of the border. Um, I love how she describes this whorehouse. Um, a house whose comforts were peculiarly comforting and whose clientele was select. Um, he implies that he's gotten information from there. Um, he, he talks of messengers being human and he says such peril lies in paramours. Um, and then we also learned that he, uh, he had a busy night. He set up a trap for John Maxwell where his men attacked John Maxwell and then rescued him from it uh, so as to get Maxwell to be in his debt. Um, we don't know why yet, but um, he says the master of Maxwell is an important personage entirely surrounded by English. Who is Maxwell? I looked on the name list and I did, he wasn't on there. Uh, he's an important uh, Scottish lord uh, who is surrounded by English. So if he goes to help the English, it's bad for Scotland. Um, so at that point, Turkey, Matt, and, both, and Will both start talking about how the men are getting restless. Uh, Lyman agrees to pander to it. Um, they come up with a bunch of ideas. Will's all like, I want to break into Hume Castle and take Lord Grey. And Lyman's like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, this is a diversion, not an act of war. Um, so Lyman makes a plan to attack the supply train um, and steal the beer um, instead of taking the whole castle. It's important. Um, that's important. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and even though it sounds like a spontaneous plan, Turkey says he's actually had it planned for days. Um, and Lyman explicitly warns no future for anyone trying to take the castle itself. Um, so what they do is they capture the supply train by surrounding them with what appears to be riderless wild horses. Um, these are all stallions that get the mares in an uproar, cause a great big distraction, and then that lets his men just swoop in and take the supply train without any casualties very efficiently. Um, he sends Will Scott to drop off the prisoners and unwanted goods um, at Melrose. Scott instead takes them to Hume Castle, um, pretending to be the real supply train, um, and gets in uh, and meets Lord Grey. Um, so here is Hume Castle. Show a picture. Um, and this, it looks like it's pretty much fallen down, and then they reconstructed a bit of it. So it's mostly not much of a place to visit, but um, there's some of it left there. Um, and we can also see Lord Grey, uh, 13th Baron Wilton. Um, I guess he looks like that. Um, and there is this like quote here about uh, his. Uh, mouth injury. So, really happened. Um, so, uh, 
Gray uh, is very grumpy about the lack of supplies and about the mouth injury. He tries to find ways to grump about it while not using any words with the letter S, which doesn't work very well. Um, Will tries to capture him, uh, fails, is captured himself, refused to say who he is, is, is kind of snarky and heroic, and then kind of realizes that this is serious business when he and his men are all sentenced to death. Um, but he won't say who he is, uh, knowing that it would put the father at a disadvantage, even though it would save his life. It would also be really embarrassing. Um, so then the real supply train arrives in tatters from being attacked, and a human tornado bursts into the room uh, with Lord Grey, which is the Spanish captain of the supply train, Don Luis Fernando de Cordoba y Avila, tarred, feathered, and outraged. Um, I have two fan arts of Don Luis. <laughs> Um, this one is from Ding Draws on Instagram. It's like a modern setting, but here is our tarred and feathered Don Luis. Um, and then here is Don Luis when he steals Lord Grey's clothes. And this is from Bella Rose on Tumblr. Bella Rose on Tumblr. Um, so Don Luis, uh, First of all, reveals who Will Scott is, convinces Lord Grey to give him his spare clothes, um, has Will brought in, slaps him in the face, tells him off uh, subtly, convinces him to faint, uh, or fake fainting, convinces Grey to let him take Scott and his men uh, away for questioning and to give them extra horses. So then they all escape. The wagon they left behind blows up. The beer they left behind turns out to be brackish water and they find a note in Spanish saying, all is not gold that glisters. Uh, and as they ride off and the men uh, talk, Will realizes that they all knew the plan. Um, they all thought Will knew the plan too. So basically Lyman anticipated the whole thing, told everyone but Will that that actually was the plan. Um, and they all think now that Will is a hero. Um, Will is kind of bitter and grumpy and thinks it was done to shame him. And uh, Lyman uh, spends the night uh, getting drunk and singing long Spanish love songs and playing the guitar. What do you think? It was a fun chapter. It was. I loved that he came in like a human tornado, and I was like, Lyman! <laughs> did you know immediately it was Lyman? Because okay. I did not. I knew immediately. Okay. It took me a while. He came in um, and started speaking Spanish. I was like, oh my gosh, it's Lyman. Well, the Spanish was a clue to me because I can understand most of it, and some of the things he was saying were a bit ridiculous. Yeah, but no, considering no. considering the chapter was already a bit ridiculous with Gray's lisp, um, I didn't quite get it until it made mention of uh, Don Luis having cornflower eyes, and there's that keyword. Whenever she talks about cornflower eyes, it's always Lyman or Lyman's mother. So that's what sort of clued me in. So it took me a while. It was the human tornado thing. I, I'm starting to feel like anytime anyone is described, any, actually maybe he starts cross-dressing, so I don't even know if I want to say any male character, <laughs> like <laughs> any character that is um, like, actually there was a moment in here that said something about that, that I pointed, I underlined somewhere. Um, but anytime someone is described with like, crazy outlandish adjectives or descriptions immediately I'm like oh Lyman's here <laughs> it's it's getting to the point where I'm like any new interesting character I'm like oh is that Lyman in disguise um okay can we go back to Agnes yeah because here is the thing so first of all I like her very much Second of all, I'm super annoyed with by the fact that like the description of her as like this girl who lives in a fantasy world and stuff is pejorative. I'm like, she's 13 and she's engaged to some probably horrible old man and she lives in a fantasy world. Like, so would I, <laughs> you know? And just kind of like, she's unattractive and imagines herself as a princess. like. Yeah. <laughs> and it's described as having awful taste quite yeah, quite awful. times. That sounds like great taste to me. <laughs> you go, girl. 
pejorative. I feel like it's extremely affectionate. Like that, the portrait that Dunnett paints of her, I feel like I can relate to so much the way that she like, she sort of, in reality, she's in this damp, cold, unpleasant place. And then in spirit, she's off in like romance land and the, the hero that she fixates on like changes depending on the situation that she's in. Like I, like this is me as a kid. This is literally me. And I, I feel like this was probably really done it as a kid because she describes it so uh, specifically. Yeah, it was definitely me as a kid. I loved it. It's like, he looked like Hunter and <laughs> Richard took her across the river and all of a sudden, oh, he's dark. Now the prince has dark hair. Exactly, exactly. And also, like, it says she has bad taste, but it's like, I again, I, I just relate to this so much because I'm like, you know, when I was like nine, I loved Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and like fantasized about Christian Slater as well as Charlotte. Like, I, I, I've had my terrible taste as a kid too. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, so here's her description. It's Agnes Harris was 13 years old, inexpress inexpressibly rich, and not very pretty. In spite of two years in the Coulter household acquiring supposedly polish and panache under Sibylla, I'm assuming. She still had a loud and energetic voice, which, bad, although I love, love it, poor skin, not her fault, and a passion for romancing. Even Sibylla, the soul of charity and tolerance, had mentioned to the girl's grandfather that the child had regrettable taste, adding inaccurately that it came no doubt from the late Lord Harry her father and not from her mother who had thrown over the joys of widowhood for a well-endowed marriage and I love that line thrown over the joys of widowhood for a well-endowed marriage meaning that was the regrettable taste <laughs> so like <laughs> the, the woman who was the idiot for like she was a widow which was like the best thing you can be as a woman in those days if you have money and she was an idiot and got married again. And so Sibylla's like, yeah, that was dumb. Yeah. I think, I feel like it's a, I feel like the narrator is very sympathetic to her, but she's out of place for her time. At her time, to be a rich, young, noble woman, you're supposed to be, you know, demure and blah, blah, blah. And Agnes is not demure. When she wants to know something, she just like demands to know what she wants to know. And, um, you know you're you're like you're supposed to be all these things that she isn't and I, I feel like that's not like I know I never felt that the narrator wasn't sympathetic to her I feel like the narrator thinks she's adorable even though like for her time she's not what she's supposed to be. now here's a question oh sorry go ahead well do you think the way that Sibylla talks about her like even Sibylla the soul of charity and tolerance had mentioned to their folks so do you think that the narrator is telling us that Sibylla sort of likes her in spite of her faults or isn't annoyed that this girl didn't learn what she was supposed to learn? Well, so what we're told that she loves is like these sort of silly old fashioned love stories. Like she's super into like cheesy romance novels about Arthur and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's like her taste isn't quite refined yet because she's 13. She likes these really kind of like dumb romance stories and she's always living in, in them. Um, but it doesn't mean that like, it doesn't mean that the book is against her. It just means that she's 13. She's young. Yeah. And it's cute. Wait, what were you gonna say? Is there any sort of impropriety going on between Agnes and Richard? Why do you that? Yeah, what do you see that? Well, at the end of the chapter, um, when he pulls her from the river and rescues her from the river, um, obviously he's not giving her CPR because that didn't exist yet. But he is, you know, pumping her stomach, trying to rescue her. And the very last thing he says is, my God, we need practice at that. Shall we do it again? Now, I assume that he just means we need practice at trying to cross the river because they did a pretty bad job. But I almost thought he was saying we need practice at sort of being close to each other. You know? Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, okay. I don't think he was saying it to her. Like, I think he was saying to her. into things too much then. <laughs> I think he was saying to her, um, he was making a, he was trying to, so she was super upset because she almost drowned. And then he says, my God, we need practice at that. Shall we try it again? Meaning, um, 
he's trying to make a joke about crossing the river. He's trying to make her feel better because she's upset. And it's kind of like, it's actually kind of a Lyman-y thing to say that he's making a joke. And it's also a lyman thing to be good with a kid to try to make the kid feel better. So I, I think it's just him. Instead of like, holy like, crap, we almost died. It's more like, yeah. oh, look, we didn't do a very good job of that. We should try again. And but, not to mention, it's, it's September in Scotland. So the water's got to be very cold. I mean, I went swimming in Loch Ness in November once, which was a mistake. But it's cold, so that's adding on to it as well. That's why they go to the Douglases. Because mm -hmm. it's closer than uh, Bel Belagin would have been? Was yeah. that where they were supposed to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this place. Um, what did you guys think of the Douglases? They're a bit conniving. Douchey rich people? Yeah. Like, Are they for Scotland or England? They do talk or quite a lot about remember, like, the protector, sing. who's King Edward, I believe. Uh, this is like the guy who looks after King Edward, because Edward's Okay, King. yeah. Yeah. I thought they were just, um, yeah, the regent, right? The regent is the protector. Um, I thought they were just out for, like, whoever's gonna... They didn't seem to have a loyalty one way or the other. I got the impression it was just like, well, whichever way the wind blows, for our benefit, that's the way we're gonna go. They so, are. They and... If they can play both sides against the other and not get caught. I have another quote that I really love, which was the, the way chapter four starts out. Um, on Sunday, the day after the affair at Lake of Menteith, which is where um, Lyman had been with the little queen, Lord Coulter was also taking aquatic exercise of a kind which all but turned his epithalmics into elegies. Um, he almost and, died. I had to look that up, a uh, poem or song to celebrate a wedding is a, a epithalamic. Um, right. But I just like cracked up because that is like the best way ever to describe falling into a river. It almost turned his wedding song into a dirge. <laughs> yes, aquatic exercise. Mm. Yeah. And I, I also love that Marietta, it is certain, was not alone in finding her husband baffling. <laughs> yeah. That was great. So, um, one thing I noticed in this one is the use of names, um, and in particular, there's a whole bunch of kind of demeaning uh, sort of feminine nicknames that Lyman gives to Will, um, and then there's the way that Lyman is referred to throughout, um, which is usually as the master, um, which comes from his title, he's the master of Coulter as his brother's heir. Um, but the fact that she uses the term the master to describe him, um, I feel like is an interesting way of like calling people something in order to uh, kind of emphasize what they are in that scene or in that way that she's describing them. So she's talking about his like mastery of leading this group of men um, and his like sort of inhuman almost like sort of tough control and like almost like domination of this group of men to make them do what he wants. Yeah. Like, I thought chapter five was, like, I thought it was entertaining, and it, it was fun to see, like, it was sort of like a madcap romp, you know? It was fun to see this bonkers deception of that Hume castle, you know, and, and the rescue and everything. But I'm not really sure it told me anymore about, like, what's gonna happen or who people are other than i i learned a little bit more about will scott and i'm not as i'm not very impressed with what i'm learning about him but other than that like i'm not sure like lyman's really good at bonkers decept deceiving people <laughs> you know? he's a master planner like huh? the plan that he pulled off in order to rob Hume Castle had many different levels and they all sort of worked based on different people having different knowledge. That's and not easy to accomplish. So he's really good at reading people and figuring out what they're going to do. Well, we have a lot of chess metaphors, which is like looking at all the different pieces and anticipating where they're going to go. And I feel like it, it's like semi-explicit here that he's kind of playing game of chess and Will is one of his pieces. Mm -hmm. He even asks Will if he plays chess at one point, so. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn about Will here? Just that he was willing, like, he saw, he saw Lyman, he knew the plan, like his, his deliberate choice to violate the, what he was told to do. Like he knows this person has authority over him. He's joined this group. He's actively decided to be part of this. And then he deliberately chooses to do what he thinks is right or what he thinks he should do, even though he knows he's not supposed to do it. Like it was just a blatant, I know better than the people who are in charge choice. And it just screams like arrogance and stupidity. And I mean, if Lyman hadn't thought 10 steps ahead, he'd be dead. And so would the 10 guys with him. And, you know. There's a line that li or that Will thinks early in the chapter. He thinks um, one should always see the impure. He was out of muddle of truths and half truths and into the daylight, um, which is just the most like teenager thing ever. Um, he is such such a kid. Yeah, and he's definitely living in that like, oh, I see this thing. Nobody else sees it. Why don't they listen to me? Like. I should do it like that whole that whole scene where they're talking about what to do and and Will is just like but we should go to Gray and then somebody suggests something he's like but Gray you know and then somebody else says something else and goes Hume Castle somebody else says something else and he's like not letting it go and clearly nobody thinks it's a good idea and he's just not instead of people just going like shut up idiot that's a bad idea although at one point Lyman does say okay. like you can't go like we're not starting a war and he still decides to go anyway. Like, and what do we learn about his um, his behavior with Gray, in particular that he is willing to die rather than reveal who he is? My question is, if he'd revealed who he was, would it have saved his men? I would have said not. Because I feel like if he could have saved the guys with him that he led into this disaster by revealing who he was, then his choice not to do that was selfish. If the only consequence to, if revealing who he truly was meant his father would be manipulated and humiliated, et cetera, and he wouldn't die, then his choice not to reveal who he was and die, like to, to be willing to die to protect his father, is somewhat admirable. I don't know. Well, he guys who are dying with him. Like, it's... I'm assuming that they would have used him for ransom because they definitely wouldn't have killed him had they known that he was <laughs> the son of Buklu, so. Right, so he could save his life and betray his father, or he could die and not betray his father. So, I mean, not speaking is somewhat admirable, but I think the whole 10 guys with him complicates the issue. I think that um, they would have ransomed the will because he's worth a lot of money, but they would have killed the men because they, he already knew like they didn't have enough food to feed them. So I think if he had revealed himself, it, I don't think it would have helped the men. Yeah. Um, and I think it shows like, to me, it shows that he is hot headed and, um, uh, you know, not he's definitely like a teenager but he also has some something promising in there like some bravery in there in the sense that he's he is willing to die rather than reveal himself and like it's like half pride like I don't want to be really embarrassed that I got caught but it's also like honorable not wanting to compromise his father right because there's also like a lack of pragmatism like you know if you stay alive there's a chance you can make it better like you know like if you just like letting yourself be killed is like then you have no agency at all to do anything about the situation <laughs> but so there's sort of like there would have been a pragmatic choice that he wasn't going to take which again I think you're right is a really teenager -y thing to do like super idealistic and not just not practical so and what I feel like Lyman would have said who he was, betrayed his father, and then fixed it. <laughs> like, and then done something to, you know. Lyman would fix it. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think of Will's reaction then um, at the end? Like, after he finds out all about this? Like, what, what really happened? I can see this incident being sort of 
where his resentment of Lyman grows. I'm not necessarily saying he resents him, but I do know a spoiler from the first video that you guys do that he does eventually betray Lyman. So I'm wondering if that's where this sort of starts or if he was always planning to do that. That's something I'm looking forward to finding out, so. So then what? Yeah, I mean, well, like he, the way that Lyman punishes him for this is really interesting because it's like, it's a personal punishment that doesn't involve anyone else. So everyone else thinks that he's honorable and heroic and has been part of this plan. So Lyman doesn't humiliate him in front of the men at all but it's almost like throwing salt on a wound so it's like anytime someone references him as a hero or talks about like that was such a great plan you know whatever they say about the situation his internal dialogue is going to be like I messed up I did it right you know like there's going to be this sort of internal dialogue of humiliation um which is interesting that, I don't know, that Lyman chose to do it that way. Yeah, I was gonna say, why do you think Lyman, one, let Will do this, knowing that he was gonna do it, and then two, why did he reveal to Lord Grey who Will was? I just assume that it's all part of the plan, that in order for the pieces to fall in place where they were, he needed sort of an inside patsy, someone who didn't quite know what was going on. So, you know, in order to get him out safely and his men, he sort of had to reveal that it was Will Scott as the prisoner um, and that he let Will do this because he knew that Will would be the one that would disobey his rules and try and take it anyway. So Lyman's whole plan was to get into Hume Castle from the beginning, and he expertly manipulated Will into helping him with it. Well, also, like, Will's father knows that he's with Lyman, right, already. Yeah, mm -hmm. people, people have talked about that in the last chapter. So it's not about letting people know that Will is with Lyman, because people already know that. So that's not, that was not the purpose in him telling, telling Gray. So if that's not the purpose, then it must have had something to do with Will. And, like, having Will see that Lyman let him know? I don't know. And then rescued him? Um, I don't know. Philippe, you said Lyman's plan was to get into Hume Castle all along, but what did Lyman get out of going to Hume Castle? Um, he got the supplies that he needed for his uh, merry band of thieves. Um, he, had they, he had them already from attacking He had them already. He didn't get them from the castle. Oh, you're, you're right. I'm thinking of the uh, caravan when he robbed the caravan. Um, he, he humiliated Grey. I mean, it was utter humiliation of an English sort of warden in yeah, the Scottish exactly. land. Like, I feel like, I feel like that's really petty as a, as a motivation. Like, I don't think... His sole motivation in that whole thing was just to humiliate this English guy. Like, m my opinion of Lyman goes down. I think there had to have been more to it than that. Because, yeah. Well, here's something that Will never thinks about, but Will has abandoned the Scottish to go uh, join an outlaw gang who, of someone who they think is working for the English, and everybody knows that Will has done this. Um, so Will is at some degree of risk at this point, um, and now he's known publicly as having attacked the English, and everybody knows that he did it. Oh. So that's interesting. So it gives Will some cred with the Scottish if he gets captured. Potentially. Yeah. Like an alibi. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Because obviously Gray doesn't know, Gray only knows Will in this situation, right? He doesn't know Lyman at all. Exactly. So, okay. That makes more sense. Um, we also end up with, um, I think, a, a really important moment for Will when 
he realizes that he's not just got himself killed, he's got these 10 men killed, um, which hopefully through his thick teenage skull will penetrate and make a difference. Yeah. I mean, that seemed to be a moment for him where he realized that he had led these men to their death and mm -hmm. that, that, yeah, that did seem to be a moment. Okay, can I, a, a total subject change, Yeah. but towards the end of this, towards the end of the chapter, um, the, they're talking about, um, uh, they set off again, so Scott dismounted. So Scott dismounted, and he's stiff, and he walks to where Turkey and the master were having a brief conversation. So then says, Matt, he eyed Scott's face. It looks to me as if someone has sat on our William. The master turned, passamentary glittering, which I think is the stuff that's like on his outfit, like tassels and stuff. Um, he might have changed sex. So complete was the change from the haughty choleric dawn. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so what kind of gender bending things are we going to be happening here? Because that's an interesting description to throwing off a character. There's more coming. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's okay. I, I think it does actually tell us a lot about Lyme, and he's a chameleon. He can, he's an actor. He can completely change how he appears, which then puts doubt into everything we've seen him do so far. Um, was his scene with Sibylla at the beginning, where he attacked all the women, was that acting? Um, also, his scene with Christian, where he's so sympathetic and adorable, was that acting? We don't know. Yeah, this chapter made me rethink the amnesia or not, so... I still think he had amnesia. I I'm still gonna, don't. <laughs> I'm going to do that until, until we find out. I Maybe because I like him better if he had amnesia, and I want to like him. So like, I want him to be sympathetic. So. I'm still waiting to find out what exactly happened till I make my final choice on that. So, oh, and why, I think it's coming. Why he ended why up. Why he was injured, yeah. Yeah, because we don't know that. It's mm -mm. true. Not yet, at least. Yeah. Um, why, what, I don't know, I, I, so for me, I found the Don Luis scene to be, like, the thing that hooked me on the book. It was a thing where I just, like, I found it so funny, I was laughing, like, so hard. I was on this bus to Atlantic City reading this book, and I was just dying, it was so funny. Um, and I, and I sort of have thought a lot about why it's so funny, um, and I think it's, like, it, it's actually, like, really brief, but she just, like, paints this, like, portrait of these characters really quickly and efficiently, and then she just throws, like, funny one funny thing after another like the awkward secretary whose spanish isn't very good and then lord gray's lisp and the way she uses it with the joke about um about his uh having the true lisp of castile yeah um and then just like the sort of the the social comedy of manners where the english cannot stand this arrogant spaniard but they have to be polite to him for like diplomatic reasons and you can see they're just like oh god we have to get rid of him he knows that of course and so is annoying them on purpose so this sort of a really weird connection but there was a movie from the 1970s that kept coming through my head when i was reading this scene and it's a, i've probably only seen it once when i was like seven years old or eight years old but it was called Zorro the Gay Blade and it was like a it was like a total send-up of the Zorro myth in super super campy fashion <laughs> and that's all I remember of it but um I just kept seeing like that tone being happening in this scene of like just super campy fake Spanish like somebody would just come in and go <laughs> with a sword and just you know, like you just see it happening. So. I, I love the way he calls he he names Will as oil and they're all like Will. What? <laughs> and then um and then the Escocha. And then there's this bit where where um Gray calls him an idiot and, and then like he gets all caught up. <laughs> And then the, the secretary says he was trying to say ideal, um, but it was a speech impediment and then he's trying to explain like He's trying to explain it in Spanish, and he uses the word embarazar, which he, I think he's trying to say, like, embarrassed. or he's pregnant, right? Yeah, he's pregnant, yeah. And just, like, everything. It's just, like, one thing after the other, and I'm, like, dying. And then at the end, everyone bows, and then everybody bows again. 
Um, and the fact that, that Lyman managed to not only steal like Will back and all the men back and get a bunch of horses and he got <laughs> Gray's best suit. He literally got his clothes. Yeah, I loved how he was like, oh, you can't give me the soldier's clothes because I'm sure they have louse in them, so. <laughs> just everything about it, man. Lyman, Lyman just like has no fear. And it was sort of like pandering to him too because it's the implication like, well, you don't have lice, so I should have your clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, oh man. Um, do you guys have any other favorite quotes or thoughts on the chapter? I was going to mention the uh, Castilian lisp thing, uh, but you brought it up already. Uh, I just thought that was a really clever way of sort of pointing out that Gray has this lisp that's quite noticeable in the chapter. So. And Lyman gives it to him as a compliment, so he mm -hmm. should be, like, be offended. <laughs> You're doing it so well. I actually loved this thing at the end, the very, very end of the chapter where um, Will is, she says, one puzzle still nagged. How, asked Scott, did you know that the leader of the supplies would be Spanish? The master raised his weary eyebrows. He wasn't. And I just loved that. <laughs> you idiot. Like, and yeah, it was just like this lovely capsule of Lyman's planning and bravado. And, yeah. He's a very smart guy. And good and, but also his cynicism a little bit, you know, just like he's tired. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually, I mean, this is a super funny chapter, but there's always that underlying it, like his, his dishevelment and the fact that he's drunk every so often and the fact that, uh, the, you know, the way he talks to the men being so harsh. Um, and like we sort of talked last time about who is the real Lyman, this, if he really did have amnesia, why was he so different than this like cold person? And I thought you had really interesting thoughts on it, Say that again. Um, when I asked you last time why Lyman was so different when he had amnesia, um, I thought your feedback on that was really interesting. Yeah, I just like, I really want him to have had amnesia because I want that, I want like that sort of um, release of his worries and cynicism to have revealed something true about the character and like I'll be disappointed if that's not true. You said specifically last time when people have that kind of hard like wall up against them. Oh yeah. Like what yeah. that says about them. Right that, that his like just the weight of all of his circumstances and his choice like his own choices and the choices of others weigh heavy and the the fact that perhaps under amnesia some of that weight is gone is interesting yeah you said it as like when you encounter someone who has that kind of wall against the world that that what that tells you is that that person has been traumatized yeah that there's all that trauma yeah there's trauma has so <laughs> It just, yeah, it just impacts us all in deep ways. That it's a heavy topic for a, a funny chapter, but <laughs> to me, it's it's like it's one of the things I really love about the books is it is kind of like a study in the impacts of trauma, and it was very insightful for you to notice that in like the first few chapters. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but there's also like I just wonder. I mean when we're dealing with people who are living in this kind of situation where they're living in war, like the, the Scottish border was war torn for time immemorial. I mean, and the, the stress of particularly, and I think this is true for Lyman, although I've thought more about it in terms of women and what, women encounter in terms of power and lack of power but i think it's true also for younger sons and people who are not um in having without specific positions of power it's just traumatic and there's just there's just stress and the way that stress 
the way that trauma and stress impact the body and the brain, you know, like as we grow, especially if we're encountering that kind of trauma as preteens and teenagers, like it just impacts our brain and how we process the world and Yep. <sighs> more to come. We're going to talk more about this in the context of the narrative as we get further. I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. I want to see more of Agnes. Yes. So I was going to say, what, what, what do you want to see more of and uh, what do you think is going to happen next? I'm interested uh, and excited because I know what's going to happen. Um, I'm excited for the, and now I can't remember the word, uh, the the fair or the festival where Richard and Lyman will face off. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. They're gonna have like a duel or something. Yeah, and uh, there was a a word for it, that specific name, but I can't remember. So the, the bingo. You, was it? Uh, isn't that the parrot? Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay, what was that? They're gonna like torture and kill a parrot. I was very confused. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's an exotic non native to Scotland bird, but they're just going to tie it to a pole and then shoot it? The 16th century was an interesting time. <laughs> I'm very confused by that. Why is this entertaining? I mean, I guess it was the age of bear baiting and all of that, too. Um, um, I want to see more of Agnes. I like her a lot better than Marietta. <laughs> I think she's way more. Poor Mariana, nobody likes her. I her. She's. Poppin' J. That's what Poppin they call her. Yes. Yeah. So. Sorry, finally found Wait, it. The pop, they said Poppin' J as a name for the conflict? The, no, I think that's the name of the festival at Sterling where they're, or the fair that they're, where the Papingo is going to be and where they're sort of going to meet and challenge each other. That is so interesting because that word later becomes a word to mean an idiotic young man who's full of himself. Like if you call someone a popinjay, it's like, oh yeah, vain or conceited person. Exactly. Archaic, a parrot. Okay, <laughs> that's hilarious. I was like, wait a second, that's just a guy who's like really full of himself. So like they were talking about this in that chapter when they were talking about the Papingo, that it was going to be at this festival, so. I know it's coming. Um, I don't know if it'll be before this chapter is over or not, but I, I am looking forward to that scene, so. Why do you want to see a showdown between Richard and Lyman? I like their aesthetic, uh, not their aesthetic, that's the wrong word. I like their uh, sort of quarrel with each other and I, I want to see where it goes. Um, I, whereas I don't know if Sibylla and Lyman actually have beef with each other. I, I think that was all part of the act. Um, I think that Richard and Lyman do generally have a quarrel and I want to see where it goes, so. I wanna see more of the women. I wanna see more of Sibylla. I wanna see more of Christian. I wanna see more of Agnes. I'd even like to see more of the Dowager Queen and the Infant Queen. <laughs> like, I just, I wanna see the women do more stuff. But. Um, um, I like I like the portraits she paints of all these different women. Like they're all really different people. Yeah, they're not. They're not. Um, even as little as they've been in the story, which they haven't been in the story very much, except maybe Christian. Um, they don't seem to be like set dressing, you know, the way that that women often are. I like that. And they're all like appropriate for their time in the kind of social roles that they have, but they're still multidimensional people and they still exercise power in their own ways. I'm finding it super interesting that I'm getting all the men mixed up. Like, I can't remember who's who in the men. Like, you know. So many of them in the story. There's so many of them. They're basically <laughs> interchangeable. Like, they're either, they're either for the Scots 100% or they're like half of the Scots, half of the English. And I keep getting confused over who's who. But I am absolutely not confused about any of the women. Like, you know, I know who they are and what they're doing. And um, yeah, so I, I, that's kind of interesting. What, um, what purpose do you think this chapter served in the overall narrative, if any? It's hard to say yet, because we don't know what the overall narrative is. <laughs> just, I think it just showed Lyman is more cunning and how good of a planner he is, you know, where, where his goals are. I would like to know 
why uh, he is so interested in Jonathan Crouch that still hasn't been revealed, but it's yeah. coming, so. Yeah, and I mean, it shows he's a good actor. He's good enough to, and he's kind of bonkers. Like, he's willing to come in, and I mean, obviously being so outlandish was part of the deception, because you come in so crazy, so over the top, so outlandish, you don't give people a chance to, like, be like, wait a second, who is this guy, you know? So, obviously that was part of it, but you still see his ability to pull that off, which was cool. Um, but I'm with Philippe, I think, I don't know. I mean, I feel like this is sort of, we're still in like opening gambity part of the chess game. And this is, you know, we're gonna get 15 moves down the game and look back and be like, oh, that's what they were doing. Mm. Yeah, I think the next two parts, if I'm not mistaken, finish out this specific chapter. So something's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen. The I mean, something's always going to happen, but you know. I sure hope so. <laughs> I would be really bored with the rest of this book. Yeah, right. Um, all right, well, any final closing thoughts before we wrap up? Nothing for me. Looking forward to the next section. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye. Next time. <laughs>